This episode of Crosscut Talks is supported by Alaska Airlines. Hey, welcome to Crosscut Talks. I'm Mark Baumgarten, the managing editor at Crosscut. And today we're talking about evangelical Christianity and how it is that the leaders and followers in that faith became supporters of Donald Trump. The argument here is pretty simple. Critics contend that it's the height of hypocrisy for a faith built on the teachings of Jesus Christ and guided by the Ten Commandments to empower a person who has chosen supercharged hubris over humility and who is unbound by a number of those divine laws. The question is how this could happen. According to our guests, the answer to that question begins long before Trump descended that golden escalator to announce his presidential campaign, back to the movement's alignment with politics, and perhaps even as far back as its very beginning. As you know, I listen to every one of these conversations, and I have to say that this one is maybe the most fascinating I've heard. These are some very smart, thoughtful people tackling a subject that's deeply personal to them. Reverend Rob Shank is an evangelical minister who has led missionary work around the globe, and he was, for 30 years, a political activist on the religious right. His latest book is Costly Grace, an evangelical minister's rediscovery of faith, hope, and love. Reverend Lenny Duncan is a pastor of the Jubilee Collective in Vancouver, Washington, and he's the author of United States of Grace, a memoir of homelessness, addiction, incarceration, and hope. Dr. Kristen Dumay is a professor of history at Calvin University, where she focuses on the intersection of gender, religion, and politics in recent American history. Her new book is titled Jesus and John Wayne, How White Evangelicals Corrupted a Faith and Fractured a Nation. Leading the conversation, in expert fashion, is USA Today columnist Kirsten Powers. One additional note, you won't hear a defense of Trump or the evangelicals who stand with him here. We did reach out to a number of evangelical ministers who support the former president, but none were available to take part in the conversation. All right, I hope you enjoy the talk. If you have any feedback, please send it to talks at crosscut.com. Okay. On with the show. Let's welcome our panelists, uh, Reverend Duncan, Reverend Shank, and Dr. Dumay. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, I want to start with Reverend Duncan. Um, How surprised were you when white evangelicals uh, supported and rallied around Donald Trump? I mean, not at all. I mean, the interesting thing was that I knew from the minute he came down that golden escalator, he was going to be president of the United States. And and part of it is really? because wow. I, I think part of it because I, I mean, and, you know, and Saturday Night Live famously did a skit about this. Right. Where like no black people were surprised. If you remember the, the election night skit where, you know, all the white people were like, this is the most shocking thing to ever happen. And all the black people were like, OK. I mean, this is the, directly from their playbook. You're talking about a movement that was built on segregationism, right? That didn't work for them, so they moved it to women's bodies and the anti-abortion movement. And they've constantly weaponized themselves as a political ideology that has come down over and over again with white supremacy and, this, and, 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 the po- and, and some of the worst politics of our country, over and over so this wasn't surprising at all. This is exactly where the evangelical movement's been headed since it started. Reverend Shank, you have been, you, you still consider yourself an evangelical and you have uh, been part of the movement for a very, very long time. And you've rethought some of your core views and have talked about that, particularly on abortion. Uh, how did it seem to you when you, when you saw him come down that escalator? Did you expect to see even white evangelicals rallying around him? Well, uh, had I known Reverend Duncan at that time, maybe I would have been better prepared because uh, it did it did take me by surprise, mostly because, frankly, when I was on the religious right, the hard religious right, 
I often use Donald Trump as the epitome of what it meant uh, to be an immoral person, mm -hmm. uh, to violate the Ten Commandments, for example. In fact, I can remember in one sermon checking off the numbers of commandments that Donald Trump had violated flagrantly. He was a great sermon uh, example. So when my folks went over to Donald Trump and I watched him work a room, in fact, the first time I encountered him in person, was at the 80th birthday party of uh, one of the uh, premier uh, Christian celebrities uh, and in the country. And he'd worked uh, the room that was Pat Robertson of the Christian Broadcasting uh, you know, Network, CBN. Mm -hmm. And I watched him work a room. And, and as I saw each table full of my colleagues, uh, very conservative, evangelical leaders from all over the United States fall in line. Frankly, by that time, I was mortified. I, I, I thought something very terrible is happening here. And that worked in concert with my own examination of the parallels between what happened in Nazi Germany to the Evangelische Kirche, the evangelical church of that country of that period, and what was happening in among my own peers and that put me on a different path. So um, I, I didn't see it coming, uh, and uh, and I, I suppose I should have. Hmm. We'll have to get back to the Germany reference. Uh, Dr. Dr. DeMay, I just want you to weigh in on this. Yeah, so as a historian, I, um, I had been looking into uh, evangelical understandings of masculinity uh, for, for a number of years already, particularly a uh, militant conception of Christian manhood, Christian masculinity. And I noticed how um, already for um, 15, 20 years, they'd really been embracing this kind of warrior masculinity. And um, when I looked into it, I saw that there was a much longer history actually. Um, so the idea that a Christian man, a Christian leader needed to be aggressive, needed to be tough, needed to uh, be able to do whatever needed to be done to protect faith, family, and nation. And so that was in the back of my mind. And uh, I, I hadn't actually been paying super close attention, and I'm very bad at predicting the future as a historian anyway. So I, I can't say that I, I knew right away that, that Donald Trump was going to be the next president. But I was watching evangelicals very closely, um, especially um, through the primary season. And seeing more and more um, end up backing Donald Trump, really from the grassroots up, from the bottom up, not not initially from the leadership. And I started paying attention to the language that I was hearing to justify this support. Uh, language about, uh, you know, he's our ultimate fighting champion. He will protect us. He will protect Christianity. And um, <laughs> this this resonated with, with what I had heard before, what I had read uh, in this popular evangelical literature, right, that, that you know, millions of books on this rugged Christian masculinity, masculinity had been bought and read and studied by evangelicals for a couple of decades now. And so that was really the connection for me. Um, what I came to see with the election then, um, it, it really crystallized around the Access Hollywood tape release, right? I thought well, we've seen this before. Um, and then with the election, the language that I was hearing in by some pundits, how could evangelicals betray their values from the history I had studied? I realized that wasn't the right framing. Um, we just needed a better understanding of what evangelicals values actually were. Can you just say a little bit more about that? Because you're saying that it wasn't a betrayal of the values. Sure. What so exactly when, when we think of, you know, family values, evangelicals, or the moral majority, that 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 sounds quite lovely. Uh, but if you look historically at what uh, what's really at the core of evangelical family values, it really does come down to the assertion of white patriarchal authority. Um, and the whiteness is important in the patriarchal authority. And historically, you can see that um, in terms of the origins of the religious right, the role of protecting um, school segregation, and really the reassertion of masculine power. And this is back in the Cold War era, Vietnam War era. All, right, mm. all of this is was really the, the, the catalyst for the rise of the religious right and for the formation of uh, contemporary evangelical political political and cultural identity. And if you locate the assertion protection of white patriarchal authority at the heart of family values, evangelicalism, that's where you can really see the consistency here. That's, mm -hmm. the, mm, Go ahead. Yeah, no, I was just going to say that. I mean, that's 100% it is that, you know, 
um, you know, from my perspective, what we're constantly running into is the 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 deaf gasp of white supremacy in the public sphere. And it's grabbing anything it can. And part of what it's grabbing is the evangelical movement. I mean, this is a movement that can't even recognize. I mean, this is a movement that would put Christ to death today. If a brown man robbed a religious bank after having a street style protest, they would absolutely support his death. Right. This is they, they, they wouldn't even recognize Jesus if he showed up. Well, and so yeah. it, 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 it all is about reinforcing white supremacists or white heteronormativity on the world. I mean, you even look at what um, uh, some of the problems it's having with uh, in the UMC church right now. Right. I mean, that's just a product of colonialism. They went over there and did missionary work where they convinced a bunch of African bishops that the best way to live in the world is to have 2.5 kids in the nuclear home and support capitalism and all these American values. And now the UMC is going to be split in half because those same bishops came back and they won't allow queer kids into their denomination. Right. This is all a product of colonialism, white supremacy and the reinforcement of that. And it's very important to uh, to to America and this republic that that continues to, you know, happen. And and, and, and evangelicalism is the fuel for it. It's the religious fire that they throw on it. It's how they get people fired up about it and believe just like the doctor was talking. It's about king and country and serving the Lord and protecting their family. It's. But as a pastor, can you speak? Because a lot, a lot of people in our audience are not necessarily religious. And so could you speak to the, what you just said, that you know they have created this image of Jesus that is incorrect? Could you explain to somebody who perhaps isn't a believer or isn't familiar? Um, although, honestly, I, I often find that people who aren't believers know more about Jesus than some of the people in the church. But um, if you could just maybe explain what they're seeing incorrectly. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think the big thing that the, the, the big mistake that uh, religious leaders, particularly American religious leaders, have mistaken in the story of Christ is it's through a conspiracy of the state and religious leaders that the Messiah is killed. You have to understand for Jesus to be publicly lynched, and that's what we experience in the gospel, it's Jesus being publicly lynched the same way Emmett Till was lynched, the same way that Trayvon Martin was lynched the same way that George Floyd was lynched, by the same systems. I mean, think about it. He's arrested in the middle of the night for false charges. His friends have to escape and arrest. He's then publicly lynched, ripped naked, you know, which is sexual assault in front of the entire community, beaten to the core. Whose experience does that model in America other than black Americans? Whose, Whose life is that in this republic? Right. And then how's he die? Well, it's through a conspiracy of religious leaders working with the state. Who is the state? Rome. And who does Rome represent? Well, it's the first time Europeans show up in the Bible. And it's also it's also, um, you know, it's empire. It's 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 what we're building now. It's like the American empire. So it's the exact same thing. So what we have is the story of a savior through a conspiracy of religious leaders and political leaders being murdered by law enforcement legally. Mm-hmm. Reverend was, Shank. You, do you know what I mean? That's a different I way of looking at it. Yeah. yeah. yeah so. no, and Reverend Shank, uh, I'm interested in your reflection on this and, and how it plays into the, the support of continued support and worship. Uh, of Donald Trump, um, because I think if we had somebody here who was a pro-Trump evangelical, their head probably would have exploded by now, right? I mean, they don't. Um, why, why is it that that um, so many white evangelicals can't see this in a, that's in this story when it's so clearly what's happening? I mean, this is this is not Jesus was not a Westerner. Jesus was, you know, uh, was not uh, you know a big strong Rambo man. He wasn't any of these things that they keep suggesting that he is in fact he was he was poor and brown um why why are why, why are white evangelicals who i always hear saying all they care about is the literal truth of the bible so resistant to seeing the literal truth of the bible well because uh, it challenges us you know i direct the dietrich bonhoeffer institute dietrich bonhoeffer was a young brilliant brave christian leader 
uh, in Nazi era Germany. Um, he was an early opponent of Adolf Hitler and National Socialism. He would lose his life in that struggle at age 39. Uh, but, you know, Bonhoeffer uh, reminds us that uh, when we read the Bible, we have to read the Bible against ourselves, not for ourselves. It's not to reinforce who, you know, we think we are and our presuppositions and imaginations. It's to challenge all those things. And that's why I'm going to say, as we do in evangelicalism, yay and amen to Reverend Duncan's <laughs> little preachment there, which was pretty inspiring. And when you hear the truth spoken, and, and one of the truths I've been speaking lately to my colleagues most of my colleagues and friends support Donald Trump, in fact, ardently defend him to this day. And one of them literally defended him on the floor of the United States Senate uh, in the first impeachment. Uh, so I keep company and conversation with these folks and we text and we talk and we email and we exchange opinions and ideas. And most of them, uh, are unaware that Jesus was a man of color. So one of the but what about I, geography? I'm sorry, I have a really hard time with this. Well, it's like, it's geography. Look at, at who do they think lives there? Well, uh, it, you know, a European uh, Israeli. Uh, you're, you know, an Israeli with European blood. That's who they imagine lives there. Uh, and incidentally, I'm going to talk as something of an insider here. My father was Jewish of Ashkenazi descent. Uh, my mother, uh, born Catholic, raised Episcopalian and converted to Judaism to marry my father. And I was raised in a Jewish environment, but uh, it was European Judaism. And that's what people imagine because, you know, most of the leaders you see in Israel are of European descent. So let's say, you know, Jesus looked like a German. Uh, and in fact, most of them have a portrait in their church or in their home that reflects that. And so that's what, how they've been formed. I was formed a little bit differently. I was aware that Jesus was a, a, an East, a Middle Eastern man from the Levant and therefore looked more like a North African than he would have like a European. And that always kind of, you know, left me with curiosity. Like, does anybody really know what Jesus looked like here? I mean, he didn't look like he, a Scandinavian immigrant as yeah. we see in, in most churches in the Midwest, in the United States. But most evangelicals have grown up only on that. Yeah. Uh, that's how they've been shaped and formed. So some of this uh, is educational. Some of it is simply, you know, uh, administering doses of reality. But an awful lot of it will be denied and refused. Uh, so, you know, this is a struggle I'm engaged in because, frankly, I'd like to stay an evangelical. I'm not sure that I can, but I would like to. I've been one for most of my life, uh, you know, going on 50 years now. And there's, there's a good thread that runs through the history of evangelicalism. There are pacifist churches, peace churches today that do wonderful work advocating for social justice. They are welcoming people, loving people. I would like to identify with that wing of evangelicalism. The other may be so toxic now that it's irreparable. I'm not sure. We may have reached uh, a fatal stage of the demoralization of American evangelicalism. Uh, well, Dr. Dume, I mean, what do you what do you think about that? Do you think that there is a, that there is a I don't know a, a, the strain that that Reverend Shank is talking about? Uh, there definitely is. Uh, I mean, there's always been, uh, as one historian has called it, a moral minority within the evangelical movement. There's always been a social justice wing. We have the evangelical left. Uh, and, um, and what I see today is, I mean, many of those, or at least some of them have walked away, right, are unable to hold this together anymore. The evangelicalism now has really essentially come to mean white conservative Republican politics for many people. And some people want to kind of fight against that and reclaim evangelicalism. But, um, you know, others are now 
becoming evangelicals because they're joining that understanding of evangelicalism. And so the power dynamics are, are certainly on the side of the kind of white conservative uh, Republican understanding of what it is to be an evangelical. Uh, but you do have uh, dissent within the white evangelical community. I've been observing that significant dissent. And I think in uh, the wake of the election of Donald Trump, in light of the last four years, and even escalating in the last several months, I think, um, post uh, January 6th, I've seen an interesting sorting out, kind of resorting within white evangelicalism, that there are many people who are, um, you know, kind of looking across this chasm. Uh, the chasm cuts through churches, through families, people who thought they believed the same thing, people who who said the same words, who prayed the same prayers are now looking at each other saying, who are you? What do you believe? And so what I see happening, this, this evangelical reckoning that somebody like Ed Setzer has referred to uh, is real. But what I see is it's it's largely an individual reckoning. So I see a lot of white evangelicals saying, this is not what I believe. How could you? And some of them are leaving their churches. Some of them are trying to change their churches. You have you have pastors who are trying to preach <laughs> against this, um, but, but many of them are losing their jobs. Uh, and so I see institutionally very little shifting yet within white evangelicalism. The institutions are holding strong. Uh, the donors, the constituents are, are, are very powerful. And so many of the evangelicals themselves who are saying, this is not what I believe, find they, they have to walk away. They end up leaving. And so this reckoning is happening largely on the individual level. The institutions are, um, I'm not seeing much institutional change at all. And may I just add a, 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 an asterisk to the professor's remarks there quickly, and that is, if American, if white American evangelicalism can be reclaimed at all, it will probably require a revolution, uh, a reformation on the scale of, uh, you know, the, the, the 16th century uh, reformation because it, it has to be so radically changed and transformed to the core. I don't think trimming around the edges will help. The, the core has to change. And this is where my hero, I keep, I always reference dear Bonhoeffer, uh, and he's worthy of some attention in our time because the backdrop of his own crisis in Germany reflected much of what we're experiencing in the white evangelical church here in the US. And Bonhoeffer, uh, when he was challenged, even as a young teenager, uh, he was asked by his family, why would you want to uh, join up with a moribund institution as a theologian or a member of the clergy? He said, if the church uh, is moribund uh, and corrupt, uh, then I shall reform it. He was that bold and brash. And I think we have to go to the core that both the professor and, uh, and Pastor Duncan refer to here. We have to go to the absolute core of it. And that will be very painful and tumultuous, but it has to happen. Yeah. Pastor Duncan, do you think that that's a possibility? Yeah, I say it's already happening. I mean, the good thing for the Christian church is that queer people and BIPOC people are coming to save your asses, like we always do, like we always do for the Republic, right? The good thing is, is that, you know, you've got people like James Cone and womanist theologians, you know, the, you know who, who, who have been setting the stage for this for a long time, that most of the candidates coming to mainline seminaries are either queer or queer adjacent, that there are trans people who are like representing the power of the, um, of the Imagio Dei or the divine in this world, that this reformation has been happening the entire time. And what we're really seeing out of evangelicalism is its response to that. You know, in most major American seminaries, you can't even gender God without getting an F on a paper. But most pastors are afraid to tell you about the sacred feminine from the pulpit. It, 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 it's beyond the fact that that they are trying to, um, you know, because education is a part of it. Uh, but But as a pastor and as a clergy member, we play a part in it. And clericalism is really the problem with the church right now. It's the fact that most people want to retire off the widow's might. Most pastors want to retire off the widow's might. 
you know, at our church at Jubilee Collective, our whole thing is we don't even call ourselves a church. And our saying is our job is to work Pastor Lenny out of the job. We need to be preparing people for the world beyond the Christian church because there will be no Christian witness in America if we do not throw ourselves wholeheartedly into the work of dismantling white supremacy. And I think the timetables moved off, moved up. I used to think it was 50 years from now. I think it's like 10 or 15. Not only are the institutions dying, but the sacred story of the revolutionary Jesus Christ may be gone from the North American continent. And it will only be a phenomenon of the global South. And that's because that is who Jesus always is with, the people on the streets. Here in Portland, he's out marching every day. I don't know what Jesus is doing in your town. And it's not the Christ that evangelicalism knows, or the mainline church for that matter. We have just as much sin, just as much brokenness, and just as much to pay back to this republic as anyone else. So as a pastor, it, 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 it's, 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 it's our own desire to keep our own jobs our selfishness and our fear to tell the truth. That is the problem with the church. It falls a lot at our feet. Yeah, but I, I think I mean, something we've all been talking about is that with the white evangelical church, though, they're very uh, focused on and very good at, frankly, amassing power. Uh, and so it's not, it, you know, we speak of it as a church, as a, as a religion, as a spiritual movement, but it's also, you know, you were, we were talking during the break, it's sort of like a corporation or a, a business or an ideology. It's, um, which is why it's hard to imagine it going away because I think, you know, right now we're seeing a lot in the news, the latest move that they've made is to come out against critical race theory and completely distort its meaning. Uh, you know, people who uh, who actually work in anti-racism that I know are like, I don't, what are they even talking about? You know, it's just sort of yeah. coming out of nowhere. Um, like no one really even believes what they say that, it is, and but they're very good at framing the conversations that culture is having, even people outside of their sphere of influence. So I don't know if any of you yeah. who wants to weigh in on this, but you know, I'm interested in your thoughts about what they're doing or what they're trying to accomplish. I mean, I, I certainly have my ideas with this well, movement's critical race theory. I, I, I can I say their goal is accomplished, though it's Christian nationalism. Their goal is accomplished. I don't know if the evangelical church is even a church anymore, if it's just become a nationalist ideology. And that's what it really is. And critical race theory plays a part in that. You have to keep white people pure and you have to and, keep this country pure and keep them in power. And and there, I think, lies the critical question. What What is the nature of the American evangelical movement now? Is it the church? Are we even Christian? And I would argue that in fact, we are not. We are no longer a Christian movement. We are no longer a church. I lived through that transformation. I made my public profession of faith in Jesus Christ in 1974. By 1985, I was sitting in the front row at uh, the annual convention of the National Association of Evangelicals when Ronald Reagan addressed us and felt the glow and the power and it's very seductive and i don't mean to excuse myself i'm deeply ashamed and i'm embarrassed and i regret the 30 years i spent on the religious right but i became a convert in that moment i became a convert to a new movement and it was a political movement uh and it was uh informed and energized by the reach for power and domination and control and i watched it unfold and and it all but ruined my faith and it took another conversion for me to relocate jesus christ uh and the gospel if i just want to let everybody know yeah real oh. quickly i just want everyone to know that we will be taking questions but we're just gonna we're gonna talk for a little bit more and probably about five minutes we'll start taking questions so go ahead Sure. So as a historian, um, I've, I've examined evangelicalism and not just kind of top down leadership, but also evangelicalism as a as a popular culture, as a consumer culture even. And um, so I affirm everything you said in terms of it is an ideology. Right. But it's, it's not just an ideology. It's an ideology that has been um, uh, really perpetuated through sermons, through devotional practices, through Bible studies, right? It's mixed together. It is a faith, right? It is a religion. 
and it's an ideology. And so, so people are reading books um, or they're listening to Christian radio, right? They're listening to Focus on the Family and they're learning about how to raise your kids, but in a way that is caught up in this ideology that also has very clear political implications. And, and they're reading devotional literature that presents a Jesus that does not look like the Jesus that Reverend Duncan was, was describing at all. This Jesus is a, a white man on a horse with tattoos down his leg and he's charging into battle wielding a bloody sword slaying his enemies and that is the christ that they are to follow right and so it is a faith it is a um it is a genuine faith and it is linked up with christianity and um and i think one of the things that history can do and that, that i try to do um in in this historical study is to show how the two became entangled right this kind of biblical christianity with this cultural and political packaging and because so many evangelicals have lived inside this evangelical subculture right they they have not heard the outside stories they have not heard the the stories of the brown jesus they have you know this is Christianity, default Christianity to them, and it is Christian nationalism, and it is linked up with white supremacy, but it has always been packaged and sold just as plain Christianity. And, um, and, and so they need to get step outside of that culture, of that consumer culture, and they need to, to encounter other ideas. And when that happens, that's when you see this change happening. That's when you see this, this epiphany. And I've seen it so many times. I've heard from so many readers who this is, you know, I lived this, this was the story of my life, but I never understood how all these pieces fit together. And it's because they have largely controlled their own narrative, consumed their own story and needing to hear that outside story. That will, is what will challenge it for them. And also, yeah. as a, I, I just want to say that true that that's very true. I don't want to sound like I'm trying to say that they aren't Christian. No, they're they're they're, they're inherently Christian. Yeah. I mean, Christianity mm -hmm. created racism. That is what the Spanish Inquisition was. It was the first time blood was used to define the difference between people. That's a that the church mother church invented racism and race, and mother church supported the transatlantic slave route, colonialism, the the doctrine of discovery. These are all the creations of mother church. And so to pretend that we're, I just don't want to come off as if I'm trying to say as a pastor that I represent some different Christianity. No, I inherit that 1800 year old apostolic tradition of oppression and all the other good stuff too. Yeah, exactly. That's all mine. Yeah, which is why I think it is, it's the both and in the church, right? The, the church has both been an unbelievably oppressive, brutal uh, force uh, in this in this world, and it's done a lot of wonderful things and has a lot of wonderful things to offer. I think the question is how do you, how do Christians make things right in this world? The things that they have made that they've broken, you know how do how do you then come forward and try to fix where you've made a mistake? And, and I, I'll say, Pastor Shank, you have modeled that a little bit with reckoning. Uh, and I'm going to move over now to some questions from the the people who are watching and. It, relates to how you reckoned with your work around abortion. Um, somebody asks, how does the panel feel um, that the issue of abortion is so divisive and intractable for our country? Can we have any hope that we'll find common ground or make some kind of peaceful compromise on this issue? And I'm wondering, um, Pastor Shank, if you could talk a little bit about that and just tell a little bit about your story. Well, I'll just start by saying, you know, I entered what is commonly referred to as the pro-life movement back in the late 80s. When I did, uh, we identified very closely, for good or for bad, uh, with the civil rights struggle. We sang all those songs. We listened to those voices. Uh, MLK uh, was a popular figure in that movement. But that quickly waned when we shifted attention away from our concept of vulnerable human beings, both uh, mom and child, and uh, shifted towards curing that problem through legislation, through bullying tactics, uh, through violence in word, and eventually in deed. Uh, there were people in my wing of the movement uh, who were present in events I hosted that eventually picked up uh, guns and started shooting uh, abortion uh, providers and, and others. 
Uh, so, you know, that shift occurred very early on in the movement. And it took me a long time to face the reality of that. Once I did, I realized this is no longer about vulnerable human beings. This is about dominating and controlling vulnerable human beings. Again, for the same reasons we've been discussing up to this point, I had to come to terms with that and a whole lot more, including the propaganda uh, that we had published and uh, promoted for three decades. Uh, and eventually became a tool for individuals who, who who could not have cared less about the victims uh, or the vulnerable. They cared only about one thing, using abortion as a quick means to mobilize voters uh, in their favor. And that was the Republican Party. Uh, it, it became crystal clear to me late, too late in the game, that the individuals I was working with in Washington, D.C., in the Congress and elsewhere, uh, regarded the the pain and sorrow and drama, uh, you know, surrounding abortion uh, as anything worth their attention. It was only, will it get us the votes we need? And that was the end of the matter. And at that point, I had to start reevaluating, and that came too, too late in the game. Yeah, and I think it's fair to say Trump weaponized that issue uh, pretty well. No, um, yeah, so for another question from somebody who's watching, uh, they, they'd like to know how the prosperity gospel influenced evangelical support of Trump. Um, Dr. Dumay? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was a very influential wing, and and you know you can get kind of kind of pure prosperity gospel, but then just the influence of these teachings uh, throughout American evangelicalism, right? Because evangelicals are rather promiscuous consumers within this larger movement, and so the reach of the teachings of success of um, of what leadership looks like is somebody who is wealthy, right? In 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 this case, um, I, I looked a lot at uh, ideals of of you know leadership in terms of masculinity and terms of power, uh, but you can be a, a warrior on the battlefield. You can be a, a warrior in the world of business, right? And there too, the ends will justify the means. And so, so if you are for somebody like like Trump, who appears um, who appeared to be incredibly successful, incredibly wealthy, if you ignore all of his bankruptcies and his debt and so on, uh, right? That he um, he absolutely kind of fit into this this um, uh, framework of clearly God is blessing him and and his success is proof of that rather than what I, I think probably um, uh, many or at least our, our pastors here today would argue that the, the model of Jesus is not one of worldly success, right? It's it's one of divesting of power. It is one of of poverty, of self sacrifice. Um, but the influence of the prosperity gospel throughout evangelicalism, um, and through this popular culture, through televangelism, and so on, certainly did set up many evangelicals to see somebody like Donald Trump as somebody who was anointed by God, who was this model of success. Uh, even though that that really, I think, uh, contradicts the heart of the gospel teachings. Yes. And, and I would um, only, um, I would only add to that quickly that money, of course, equals power. Right. And when we right. discovered, I can tell you from the inside, when I would sit with fundraising professionals who told me the, the more anger and the more fear that I can gin up, the more money I will get for you. The more money you have, the more power and influence you will have. And I watched that take charge, just take possession of the movement I had identified with uh, for three decades at that point, and it completely changed the nature of it, completely changed. The, and, and I would say at that point, it apostatized from the gospel. Uh, so this all, again, and, and remember that the temptation to power in evangelical theology uh, yes. comes from Satan, yeah. not from God. Yes. Um, Pastor Duncan, this is for you. Um, what what did you see when Trump cleared the crowd with tear gas to hold his photo op at the St. John Church during Black Lives Matter rally in front of the White House? Yeah, um, at that time, I was uh, mostly spending my time in Portland in front of the Justice Center, uh, putting holy water and praying over all the people who were being shot at by federal agents and being kidnapped by Trump's personal um, 
army, um, which is, by the way, very disturbing when a border patrol starts operating in the interior of a country. That's usually what happens before a republic falls. But what I saw, honestly, what I talked about is a couple things. The first thing is it's 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 it was proof that the church is no longer God's chosen vessel on earth, I believe, like in the bottom of my heart. And that's a hard thing to swallow as a minister. And this will be my last call as a minister. Once I finish this call, I can no longer um, with integrity work for the Christian church. Um, I've informed my bishops and everyone about that. Uh, the second thing is, is that this, this is, this is, um, this is exactly what we're going to see out of the, uh, out, out of the so-called Christian church um, as it continues to go forward. What we saw was exactly, you know, I mean, exactly what you would expect this davidic like figure like the doctor's talking about right and we forget that in the bible david is you know he he commits sexual assault he murders his friends like he's not a great guy right but we but but evangelicalism created this narrative around this tough guy this davidic figure who even though he's not so great God will find a way to fix everything he does, and it will build up the new Israel, the new city on a hill, America. And in that moment, in front of the National Cathedral, we saw exactly what we saw during the lynching of Christ in the gospel. We saw through a conspiracy of state leaders and religious leaders, the collective consciousness of America being okay with chemical weapons we don't even use in warfare being dropped on black people in front of the Episcopal National Cathedral. Now, you could say that Trump is disgusting for doing that, but then a week later, the National Cathedral had the American flag blasted all over it, right? I mean, you know, the National Cathedral. So, you know, what we saw there was exactly what we saw. What we always see, that black people in this country are the canary in the coal mine for, uh, for uh, a freedom and, 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 and justice in this republic. And what they do to us in the daylight, they will do to you in the dark. And Christ is clearly with us because we're the ones who are still suffering in the streets. Christ is more likely a black trans woman in this country than he is a white cis man. You know, and, 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 and it's just the total perversion of theology, people's belief, and, 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 and truly being duped by the church. Um, and it's and it's 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 heartbreaking, but it's exactly what the church is always used for to oppress uh, to to oppress um, uh, 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 those on the margins. That's all the American church has ever been used for in a lot of ways. But there's one thing. I mean, you, you brought up this David thing, and you know, if we've heard it once, we've heard it a million times, right? Yeah, comparing Donald Trump to, to King David, uh, you know, man after God's own, own heart. Um, but of course, I'm not trying to get too theological here, but it, it, I think it does matter that they left out the part where David repented. Right. Um, what? Or, 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 so or, you know. <laughs> so I think that. So I'm just saying it's it's it does seem like. Um, you know, that there is a, that they do tend to just pick out the things that they want. I mean, Reverend Shank, you're, you're more in that world, I guess. I mean, how do they square that circle? They don't, they also believe, by the way, that God killed uh, Bathsheba and David's first child. So that there was punishment. I, I'm not saying I believe that, but that's what they believe. Um, so how do they square that circle with Donald Trump? That, of course, he's never re repented to our knowledge for anything. Um, and certainly hadn't at that time. Yeah, I think sadly that we've lost, we've so lost sight of the prerequisite to Christian faith, as I've always understood it, which is humility. And with humility comes self-doubt. You have to ask yourself, where am I wrong? How am I wrong? Uh, who have I violated? And how have I violated them? Uh, you know, we think, because it's an old model, that the path to evangelical Christian faith starts at an altar of weeping, where we go to say, God, I am sorry for my sins and how I have sinned against you and against my fellow human beings. Once you remove that initial step of humility and you say, no, I, 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 I'm not wrong, I'm right. In fact, I'm right on everything. 
and I'm more right than anyone else. Now I think you have completely defected from the Christian faith. There is no faith in that. Uh, there is no dependency on God or a savior. So this utterly contradicts the Christian message and it nullifies any Christian faith. So for me, you know, this is the meaning of revival. You, you, you get to the place where you say, it's not the others who are wrong. I am wrong. Mm -hmm. We are wrong. And that's both on an individual and collective uh, moment of reckoning and repentance. It's very painful. It's humiliating. And it should be. We'll be back with more after this message. Ready to take your travels to the next level? Alaska Airlines is committed to providing a higher standard of safety and cleanliness throughout your journey. From mask requirements and touch-free options to HEPA filters on board and everything in between. Plus, their award-winning loyalty program, Mileage Plan, makes it easy to earn and redeem miles wherever you go, including destinations worldwide, thanks to their One World Alliance membership. If you're ready to land a low fare, next level care, and the best experience in the air, book now at alaskaair.com. Dr. Dumay, how do you, uh, this is, I mean, this is, I always feel like this is the question. How, how do you ever get the white evangelical church disentangled from politics, from Republican politics? Now, obviously the institution's not going to do that because it works for them, but how do you get the actual people uh, to see that this isn't the way it's supposed to be and that, and that there's, you know, that there are people that are trying to use them for political purposes as people in power do. I'm not saying that even white evangelicals are only people who do this. I'm just saying that this, this is what happens um, because so many people grow up in such homogenous environments where everybody is white, everybody's evangelical, everyone's a Republican, everybody thinks all the same things. And so how, how do you introduce new ideas to people like that? It's really difficult. It is, right? This is so deeply embedded and this goes back generations. Uh, so, I mean, I'm biased, I'm a historian, but I think that there is an incredible power to history here, right? Because um, evangelicals in particular, I think, uh, think, think of themselves as, you know, Bible-believing Christians. And so they think of their values as biblical values and think that, you know, they're eternal, they're timeless, they're true. Uh, when what history can do is first it can show things have not always been this way. So in terms of what Christian masculinity looks like, if we look in the 19th century, we see models of Christian masculinity that did not celebrate aggression in this, this warrior spirit, but they celebrated self-restraint. Uh, we can, we can see there, there was a time in the early 20th century when many conservative Protestants were, um, um, did not embrace militarism. They were not Christian nationalists at all. And, and once you understand that, then we can become curious, well, how did things get to how they are now? And we can um, kind of let go of these notions that what, what we have been taught uh, uh, these are just biblical values. This is what Christians do and, and what we believe. In fact, no, we have to look at who said that this was the case, who created this. And time and again, we can see that that those who were promoting these ideas were largely doing so um, to um, consolidate their own power. And something that that uh, Reverend Schenk said, which is absolutely true, that the, that the discovery, that fear helps consolidate uh, power. Um, so it, it, it brings in money, it brings in donations, tried and true. Uh, we also see that in many church communities in Jerry Falwell Sr.'s church and Mark Driscoll's church. Uh, we see this model of if you can incite fear in the heart of your followers, that will um, um, create this kind of loyalty self-sacrifice. They will give money. They will give you power. And um, when I first started my research, I thought that evangelical militancy was a result of fear. What I came to understand through historical research was that in many cases, this militancy came first, this us versus them mentality, and it required the continual stoking of fear uh, in order to uh, be sustained. And once that clicked for me, this, this whole history um, kind of took shape. And what I've seen is evangelicals who lived inside this world, um, once they see this from a historical distance, once they can see how this came to be, it does 
break things open. Um, so I would say read history. Um, and then also very important, listen to people who are different from you, particularly brothers and sisters in Christ who look different, who, who you've largely excluded from your communities historically in the present day. And those conversations also, I think, can can shake this up. And, and may I, time for one. Oh, sure. Go ahead. May I just add a quick uh, yeah. a word of advice to the pastors I hear from every week now who are agonizing over this and want in some way to help their own communities get past this. Uh, one of the things I've been recommending is that pastors preach a 52 part series on the shortest verse in the Bible. Jesus wept. Start there. The implications yeah, are great. enormous. Sounds wonderful. Okay, I think we have time for one more question, and I'm gonna um, I think I'm gonna give this to Reverend Duncan, um, and then maybe the others can weigh in. Um, this is a question from somebody who's watching. They say, "Doesn't all this confusion and corruption of religion over so many thousands of years across so many religions beg us to abandon it entirely in favor of a new paradigm of oneness, excused from any allegiance to a deity, a god, or a leader?" I mean often you're going to hear this argument, right? <clears throat> and I understand it. Why turn to the divine? As a queer black man, knowing the history of slavery in this country, knowing what the Christian church has done, knowing the people that I'm up against in academia, knowing how I went from a GED in county prison to working on a PhD, that whole journey from here to there, why do you show up? Why do you do it? Man has always searched for answers, and sometimes some of us have landed upon the divine. I think what makes America unique is that we have tried to export that to everywhere, our vision of the world, and we've tried to enforce it upon the world. And theologically, we do that because basically American churches support every mission in the world. So why continue to do that work? I don't know to be quite honest with you. I was not a raised Christian. I had very little Christian values. I was houseless. And I, you know, I encountered something that I think is worth exploring. And I think there's something beyond the church and beyond the institutions and beyond our histories of oppression. There is something that happens in between there that is unexplainable, unimaginable, and that you cannot touch. And that has been inspiring resistance for thousands of years. And I could just tell you from a Christian perspective that what the Bible really is, is the story of a creator who steps into <clears throat> human history for the express purpose of liberation. And some people call that salvation. But we experience that as revolution throughout history over and over again. And somehow this belief that the universe, the divine, that something out there wants that liberation for you, wants that freedom for you, whether it be sexual, whether it be like, you know, just free, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. That has spurred on human history. And so I explore that, you know, I think I think I, I, I think what 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 the question really speaks to is why do we allow that to um, why do, why do we use that in such oppressive ways? And I don't know. I mean, I just think that's part of that's just human nature. Part of that well, is I just think, the yeah. way we are, you know, I think I think. Mean, I hear this. But that's why I do it. But that's why I do it. You know what I mean? Yeah, As right. a black organizer, right, right, right. like I gotta believe yeah. there's a God watching my ass because ain't nobody else watching my ass. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think something that I hear commonly, and it certainly has occurred to me on many occasions, is just religion does ultimately end up doing so much harm and so much damage, and so why not just have, you know, people say why not just have a relationship with the universe uh, versus having religion and maybe we just quickly get the other two to weigh in and then I think we have to wrap this up. Well, historically speaking, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure how you would accomplish that, uh, right, too, uh, given that that there is throughout human history this this um, kind of draw to the divine, to religious identity. Uh, I think we've also seen a lot of corruption and a lot of evil done outside of uh, religious frameworks, too. So I'm not sure that that's um, the panacea that we might wish it to be. Um, so I think that, uh, you know, living in the reality uh, that we find ourselves in, uh, we 
we we need people working to do good and to seek unity within re religious frameworks, drawing on the strengths of their religious traditions and outside. And I think um, we can often find a lot of, of common ground, um, but I think I would say both and. Great. Yeah, maybe my angle would just be that um, I'm not sure there's a difference between true and good religion, seeing the world religiously uh, and seeing it non-religiously, because uh, the best of religion, I think, harmonizes with the universe as we know it, with humanity as we know one another, and as we don't know one another, uh, that... Uh, you know, the best of religion is humanistic. The best of humanism looks religious. Uh, I, I think maybe there's a false dichotomy there. And do we convince ourselves that one or the other is better? And maybe that's starting us all the way down that wrong road again. So uh, to me, yeah. it, it's just we're, we're on the path uh, to living the best we can and uh, improving ourselves uh, as as well as we can along the, the same path, believer or non-believer. My posthumous mentor, Bonhoeffer, said the greatest friend to the Christian is an atheist for many, many reasons. Yes. Well, that's a wonderful place to end this. And thank you so much. Uh, this was a fascinating conversation. And I just really appreciate all of you so much. So thank you for your time. And that's it for this week's episode. Thanks to Reverend Shank, Reverend Duncan, Dr. Dumay, and Kirsten for the talk. And thanks also to the folks in the audience who asked questions. If you'd like to be one of those audience members for a future CrossCut event, go to crosscut.com events. This episode of CrossCut Talks was engineered by Chi Lee. The live recording was engineered by Rusty Bacall and Victoria Ralph, and the event was produced by Jake Newman and Andrea O'Meara. Anne Krisnovich and Mo Cloud managed our audience engagement. If you'd like to subscribe to Crosscut Talks, you can do just that on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you listen. For the latest political, environmental, and culture news from the Pacific Northwest, visit crosscut.com. And if you would like to support the work that we do at CrossCut, whether it's the live events we host every month or the in-depth reporting we deliver every day, go to crosscut.com slash donate. CrossCut Talks is a product of Cascade Public Media. I'm Mark Baumgarten. We'll be back soon with another conversation.